I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to share with you some thoughts on PEP drugs and current strategies. In the discussion that follows, we will have an opportunity to think about the definition of PEP, talk a little bit about the background, discuss categories of PEP, think about PEP for individuals who are on PrEP pre-exposure prophylaxis, discuss PEP regimens, and then think a little bit about the factors that affect PEP efficacy, and then go on to think about care pathways for individuals who are exposed to HIV. But let me start by telling you a story. This is a story that talks about Achode. This is a 20 year old young lady who's enrolled in a beautician course in college. She's sociable, she's friendly, she loves to wear the latest fashion and she's quite popular at school and among her friends. Now, most of Achode's friends actually think she's sexually active, but she's not. Achode was invited to a party one evening and as she went for the party, she was having fun. Sadly, during the event, because of somebody drugging her drink, Achode ended up getting raped. When she came to, she realized what had happened. She remembered that during the freshman orientation, one of the counselors had told them about the dispensary in college and where they could get help if they needed it. Achode went to the dispensary, but it was night, it was locked. She went back to her room, took a shower, was devastated. Her roommate found her crying and her roommate told her that they needed to take action. She took her to the local dispensary to see whether she could get some help. They came across an elderly male nurse who listened to her story and dismissed her and said, no, Pet, this is something that we only give to deserving individuals like healthcare professionals. I know you college girls, you like to joke around and play, and then you come saying that you were raped. Thankfully, Achode's roommate did not take this line down. She created a commotion and insisted. Another nurse came by, listened sympathetically to the story and was able to give her the appropriate counseling, take the appropriate swabs and give her treatment after she tested negative. Achode faithfully took her medication for 28 days. And at the end of the time, thankfully, she tested HIV negative. Sadly, her assailant, whose name she could not even recall well, was never brought to justice as he was never caught. Let us look at some of the definitions. Post-exposure prophylaxis is any preventive medical treatment started after exposure to a pathogen to prevent the infection from occurring. HIV post-exposure prophylaxis means taking antiretroviral medicine after being potentially exposed to HIV to prevent becoming infected. HIV post-exposure prophylaxis should only be used in emergencies and must be started within 72 hours after recent possible exposure to HIV. On the background of post-exposure prophylaxis, no randomized control trials of post-exposure prophylaxis have been conducted, which is not surprising when you think about it. It will not be ethical to, for example, randomize some people exposed to HIV to PEP and others to control group that receives no intervention. However, animal studies and observational studies in humans indicate that post-exposure prophylaxis can reduce the risk of HIV. Here, highlighted in yellow, you can see that the US Center for Disease Control in its 2016 guidelines did an updated review of the evidence and said that it continues to support the idea that PEP works. What are the categories of PrEP? Post-exposure prophylaxis for HIV infection is divided into two categories. Occupational post-exposure prophylaxis given of after occupational exposure, for example, in healthcare facilities when healthcare workers have needle stick injuries. 
non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis is given after sexual injection drug use or other non-occupational exposures. In the table below, we look at some of the meaningful and less meaningful risk of transmission. For the meaningful risk of transmission, we see that blood, semen, vaginal secretion, breast milk, cerebrospinal fluid, and amniotic fluids have a meaningful risk of transmission. While on the other hand, we see that non-bloody saliva, tears, sweat, non-bloody urine, and non-bloody feces carry a less meaningful risk of HIV transmission. This table shows the estimated per act risk for acquiring HIV from an infected source by exposure act. From this table, we see that parental exposure through blood transfusion is the leading with a rate of 9,250 per 10,000 exposure. Following it is exposure through sexual intercourse and receptive annual intercourse is the, is the leading with 138 per 10,000 exposure. Also in this table, we can see other, other exposure types that carry negligible risk of transmission, which are like biting, uh, spitting, throwing body fluids, and even sharing sex toys. Post-exposure prophylaxis can also be used by an individual who is taking pre-exposure prophylaxis. We know that pre-exposure prophylaxis should be taken before someone is exposed and continue to be taken during the period of risk. But in the event that an individual taking PrEP encounters the following, then they should be put on PrEP. One, if the exposed individual has only recently started taking PrEP. Two, if the individual has been taking PrEP inconsistently. Three, if the individual has been taking the medication but on demand. Four, if the source of the infection has a known virus that is resistant to the PrEP regimen. And finally, if the source's viral load is not suppressed. This figure shows how HIV post-exposure prophylaxis protects someone from getting HIV. We see that when someone is exposed to HIV, either through percutaneous or mucosal exposure, the virus will replicate fast locally within the local tissues of the exposed individual. If an individual is given post-exposure prophylaxis, the post-exposure prophylaxis administered within 72 hours has rapid onset of action and acts on multiple sites of antiviral activity. The viral replication will be blocked and therefore the infection will be contained and HIV infection will be prevented. But if an individual is not started on PEP within 72 hours of exposure, the virus replication will not be blocked and within 48 to 72 hours of exposure, the virus will replicate in host regional lymph nodes then spread to the blood and cause a viremia. After that, the infection will be established and the person will become HIV infected. Now let us look at some of the PEP regimens that we have for adults uh, over 15 years and those who are more than 35 kilograms. Current post-exposure prophylaxis use is two nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors and an integrase inhibitor or a protease inhibitor. Tenofovir is recommended along with lamivudine or emptycitabine. For example, in Kenya, we use tenofovir and lamivudine and dol dolutegravir as post-exposure prophylaxis. While in South Africa, they use tenofovir and emptycitabine and dolutegravir as post-exposure prophylaxis. This slide shows the different post-exposure regimens for adults. So for most adults, we have the tenofovir and lamivudine with dolutegravir. While for women of childbearing potential, in some countries and in some regions, they use tenofovir and lamivudine with a boosted atazanovir. What about for HIV-exposed infants? In 2010, the World Health Organization recommended two approaches, also called options, for, for, for prevention of mother-to-child transmission prophylaxis. With option A, pregnant women were to start zidovudine monotherapy during the antenatal period and around the time of delivery, 
that to take a single dose of nevirapine with a week-long tail of zidovudine, lamivudine combination. Their HIV-exposed infants were prescribed for daily nevirapine from birth until the cessation of breastfeeding. In option B strategy, women not yet eligible for antiretroviral treatment were to initiate three drugs combination antiretroviral prophylaxis during the antenatal period and continue until the cessation of breastfeeding. During the first six weeks of life, their HIV exposed newborns were to receive daily nevirapine or zidovudine prophylaxis. Now we also have the option B plus, where all HIV infected pregnant mothers receive triple antiretroviral therapy drugs and continue the treatment for the rest of their lives while their HIV exposed infants are put on prophylaxis. PEP regimen for children below 10 years. The recommendation is that we use zidovudine and, lamivudine, and lamivudine as the preferred backbone regimen and add lopinavir, a boosted lopinavir as the preferred third drug for HIV post exposure for prophylaxis for children younger than 10 years. Abacavir and lamivudine or tenofovir and lamivudine can be used as an alternative backbone regimen. So PEP is not 100% effective at preventing HIV, but there are very few reports of HIV transmission when PEP is used as prescribed. However, there are some things that can limit PEP's effectiveness. These include one, waiting more than 72 hours after potential HIV exposure to start post-exposure prophylaxis. Two, poor adherence to PEP by missing doses and or not completing the full 28-day regimen and continuing to engage in behaviors that have high risk of HIV transmission, such as unprotected sex with multiple partners of unknown HIV status. PEP will also be less effective if the exposure was to a strain of HIV that is resistant to the drugs in the PEP regimen. Here we look at the care pathway for people who have been exposed to HIV. First, we do assessments, which are clinical assessment for the exposure, eligibility for the medication, and HIV testing to confirm the HIV status. We also give first aid, for example, giving prophylaxis for sexually transmitted bacterial sexually transmitted infections, and also giving emergency contraception. contraception. Second, we do counseling and uh, offer support through uh, counseling on the risks of HIV, the risk and benefits of post-exposure prophylaxis, and the importance of adherence to the medication. Then we give a 28-day prescription with drug information and try to look at drug-to-drug -drug interaction before giving out the prescription. We also do follow-up, and this involves uh, doing a repeat HIV test, uh, doing prevention or prevention counseling so that uh, people don't get to use PEP uh, several times when they can actually uh, stop what led them to using post-exposure prophylaxis. Then link to treatment if uh, during the retest, someone tests HIV positive. While prescribing PrEP, it is recommended that a prompt PEP initiation within 72 hours and completion of the 28-day course of the drug. We are supposed to initiate and dispense the full 28-day course of, of uh, antiretrovirals for post-exposure prophylaxis and monitor the patient for uncommon side effects. How can we maximize the effectiveness of post-exposure prophylaxis? To maximize PEP's effectiveness, we can do the following. First, we can offer PEP as soon as possible. For example, let's say a provider finds that a client is eligible for PEP, but says that they want more time to think about it. That's totally the client's decision. But providers can gently remind them that the window for PEP initiation is 72 hours after the potential exposure. So if they do not make their decision within that time frame they will no longer be eligible for PEP. Second, providers should counsel the clients on the importance of adherence and treatment completion and on ways that they can reduce their HIV risk. For example, providers can explain to the clients 
who have multiple sex partners that one way to reduce their HIV risk is to reduce the number of partners that they have, or they can use condom, or they can even do both. Lastly, we can emphasize that it's very important to return for follow-up visits so that the clients know that they can be retested and checked for signs and symptoms of acute HIV infection. If it turns out that PEP failed to prevent HIV, then the next best option for them will be to link them to antiretroviral treatment as soon as possible. So we started with a story and I'd like us to finish with another story. Let's think about Mary. Mary is about 45 years old and she's a nurse who works at the local county facility. Mary is really well liked because she's always helpful and always seeking to do the best for her patients and also to support the other healthcare workers around her. Mary is actually the one who's responsible for infection prevention activities at her local facility. One day, Mary is just about to leave for home at the end of a long, tiring day. Her colleague calls her and asks her, please come and help me. There's an uncooperative patient who needed to have an injection and it's being very difficult. Mary promptly goes to help her colleague. The patient was really uncooperative. Sadly, in the process, just after having given the intravenous injection, Mary ends up with a needle stick. Ouch, that was uncomfortable. Her coworker reminds her to immediately start HIV prep and also to take the necessary first aid. Mary's eldest grandchild was waiting for her and she needed to be able to leave quickly. She quickly thinks about, you know, that patient looked so healthy. I doubt that they're HIV infected. And anyway, this is just a little prick. I've been pricked before. Unlikely that this will lead to anything challenging. Mary quickly bleeds her hand, washes her, her finger, ensures that she uses some spirit and thinks, oh, oh well, I'll do something about it. Maybe tomorrow. I have 72 hours. Mary goes home and forgets about the incident. A couple of weeks later, she's on another shift with the same colleague who had asked for help. And the colleague remarks, how are you faring on your pep? Mary's jaw drops. She remembers that she forgot to go back and get tested and initiate herself on post-exposure prophylaxis. Sadly, at the end of the waiting period, Mary goes for testing and finds that she tests HIV positive. So in conclusion, HIV post-exposure prophylaxis is effective in preventing HIV. The efficacy is dependent on adherence and completion of the prescription. Post-exposure prophylaxis is an emergency HIV prevention option and can be used as backup in individuals who are who are on pre-exposure prophylaxis. It can also be used as a bridge to pre-exposure prophylaxis, especially on people who have used post-exposure prophylaxis on multiple occasions and have a continuous ongoing risk of getting HIV. As we finish, we would like to acknowledge the organizers of this meeting and the following individuals who took part in preparing this presentation. Thank you so much.